Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that day should overtake you as a thief. We're going to read on, but let's just stop there for a second. So the name of today's message is the news, the end times, and believers, right? We're going to look at the news cycle, uh, what the news cycle has to do with the end times, and then believers. So when you, we look here in First Thessalonians, uh, uh, the Holy Spirit opens with, there's something I'm going to tell you, but you should know. There's something that, that I'm going to, we're, we're going to go over, but you should already know this. It says that crisis comes without warning. Crisis, it says sudden destruction comes, sudden change comes, a shaking comes. And then the Holy Spirit tells us that there's you and there's them. Let's go back through it. It says, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves perfectly should per perfectly know that, that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. It comes in stealth. For when they say peace and safety, they are those that don't understand. They are those that are not aware of what the scripture says. When they say peace and safety comes upon them, then let me read it for you again. It says, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains on a pregnant woman. They shall not escape. So there's they and us. He says, but you, brethren, are not in darkness, so this day should overtake you as a thief. In other words, we shouldn't be overtaken by what, is, what, what happens in the earth. We should, we should always be prepared is where we're going to get to in the scripture. So it says that you should not be overtaken. Here's why. It says, you are sons of the light, which re light always equals revelation or knowledge. You are sons of the light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep in the night, and those who are drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, the sons of God, believers who understand the word of God, let us, who are of the day, be what? Sober, that means in control of our vessel, in, in control of us, putting on the breastplate of faith and of love and helmet of salvation. For God did not, not, did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, or whether we live or die, that we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another just as you also are doing and we urge you brethren to recognize those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord admonishing you to esteem them very highly in the love for their work's sakes be at peace one with another and so here in Thessalonians you know the key central message is that and it's really it's uh, it's, it's an end times message it's really Everyone should be prepared. Everyone should be ready. So he goes through and he says, this is something that, I, that you really should have. You should own it already. I shouldn't have to go over it again and again. That crisis comes, change comes, destruction comes without warning. Without, it comes very suddenly. And, and they in the world that don't know the word of God or don't understand or have a relationship with God can be overtaken by it. He said, but you, believers, those that understand the word, understand the time and the season you're in, you should not be overtaken by what comes on the world or on the earth. He said, because you are sons of God. You are sons of the light, sons of revelation. He said, you should walk in who you are, know who you are, and know who you serve. And there's almost, a, when, you, when you break it down, if you were to amplify it from the Amplified Bible, it means to always be alert, always be ready, always be uh, engaged, always be walking with the Lord, always be intimate with the Lord, always be intimate with his word so that you're continually plugged in and continually walking with the Lord in, in great peace. He said, and then take that, take that peace, that reassurance, that understanding of who you are, 
that no matter what's going on in the environment, in the world, whatever circumstances are happening, and we're going to go over some of the end time circumstances, but understand, take that what's in you, right, and comfort one another, edify one another, respect one another, and help take that peace that's in you, bring peace to others around you. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at peace. We looked at how we are vessels of peace. In, in Matthew's gospel, when Jesus sent them out two by two, he said, let your peace, when you enter a home that's worthy, let your peace rest upon that house. And so we're vessels of peace. We're supposed to bring peace with us, infuse the environment with peace, uh, just as Jesus did. So when we look at the Bible and we look at, at end time prophecy, we look at First of all, the word doesn't really, uh, uh, the, the Bible calls it the day of the Lord or the return of the Lord. But when you look at the end time, and when we, when we say that, we're really looking at the coming of the Lord. There's an overwhelming amount of prophecy. Uh, there's an overwhelming amount of, of, of scriptures, both Old and New Testament, that point to this time period that's still yet in front of us uh, when Jesus would return to the earth. And this overwhelming amount of prophecy tells us uh, things that are going to happen, things that are, are, are uh, both globally to the church, within the church. There's a, there's a lot of scripture that points out things that, that sometimes can, can bring fear if you look at it with, without looking at it through the eyes of scripture. But I want you to understand why, before we move on into the message, why did God choose to take over half of scripture to point not to the to the first coming of the Lord, which which there's all you know a lot of scripture that does, but to this this time period at the end, you know, why did he tell us so much? Why did Jesus spend chapters of the gospel talking about the return of the Lord? And you're gonna see today, first of all, it's to give us an understanding that that God knows the future. God knows what's ahead of us. We need we need to real that the realization of that will give you peace in that a loving God understands and knows what's in our future, what's ahead of us. And uh, aside from that, He gave us the revelation so that we could understand what was coming. And because we knew what was coming, we could position ourselves to respond correctly in it. You're going to find today that a lot of the prophecy that we're going to look at today will point to the, the, uh, the, the wrong reaction by the church or the, the actions that are, are incorrect. And so uh, the response to prophecy should be, okay, I know it's coming. I need to prepare myself if you take what we just read so that as we walk into it and through it, I'm prepared for it. Because there's most of it, if you look at it today, you're going to see that most of it says this event's going to happen and here's the natural response and the natural response is wrong and so you need to find out what the right response is. And so when you go through that, uh, that's why the, new, the news, right, what we read in the news cycle, end times, what does it say? It's coming and then the correct response, responding correctly in it, understanding it and and being able to position not only yourself, but those that you lead or those that are with you. So when, when we look at the, at the, really we have a playbook uh, is the best way to describe it. When, when God gives us a prophecy of something that we're gonna live through or that's ahead of us, we, should, we have a playbook of what's going to happen, right? And let me tell you, while God is in charge of everything, God is not in control of everything. And I'll explain that at the end, it sort of sounds odd, but if God were in control of everything, there's everyone would get saved, right? And so he gave us free will, and then he gave us the ability to have faith in his free will. And, and so I'm going to go through that. In fact, that's Tuesday's message. Turn over to Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24, which is some of the most direct, uh, uh, you know, strong, Really, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's a direct understanding of what the signs will be for the return of the Lord. Um, here they are, Matthew 24, verse 1. It says, Jesus went out and departed from the temple. So they were in the temple. His disciples came to him to show him the buildings of the temple. So while they're in the temple area, Jesus, his disciples are around him talking about how great the buildings were, how wonderful they were, beautiful they were. 
uh, Jesus says something to them. He says, do you not know or do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you that not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. In other words, this whole temple site is going to be reduced to ruins. Now, as he said on the Mount of Olives, so they left the temple area and went up into the Mount of Olives, which looks over Jerusalem. It says, and as he said on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So as they went out into this, uh, into this place away from the crowds, they came to him, and the Bible says privately. In other words, it's just, it was just their team. And they asked him three questions. When will this thing be, right, that you just said about the temple being ruined? That happened in 70 AD. And so um, the answer to that question is not here in Matthew 24. Jesus, the, the, the sister chapter to Matthew 24, it has the same events in it, is in Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 21 and 22 gets into that. So that's talking about the temple coming down uh, in the Temple Mount being in ruins and actually the, the, the des destruction of Jerusalem. So the other two questions are, what will be the sign of your coming? You know, so here he is living, so they know he's going to leave. So what's the sign? What should we look for? What will tell us that the time is drawing near that you're going to return and the end of the age. In other words, what will it be like when you return in the end of the age? Now, in their minds, Old Testament, Jesus was going to come as a, as a conqueror, which he will when he comes a second time. He'll come as a conqueror, subdue the earth, and will live in what's called the millennial reign of Christ. So we'll live a thousand years of peace, right? Um, so he's going to answer their questions. And what he does here in Matthew's Gospel is he answers them chronologically. So he, he goes through scriptures. He says, this is going to happen. Then this is going to happen. Then this is going to happen. And then this is going to happen. Four sections. So in other words, this is going to happen first. This is the first sign, big sign. And then here's the second sign. Here's the third sign. And then my return, the fourth sign. So And they're divided by the word then. Okay, so... Uh, let's look at the first section here. It says, Jesus answered, verse 4, and said to them, Take heed, beware, that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, There'll be famine and pestilence and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Verse 9, then. We start a new section. So let's look at, let's look at this first section first. First of all, it's global. Um, it's talking about the entire earth. And so there's a couple of things here. Very important uh, in verse 8. It says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Literally, what it's saying is all these are the beginning of birth pangs. So Jesus takes something, the Holy Spirit takes something from the human experience that we can look at and understand. And so he's equating these events to birth pains, which come upon a, a, a woman when she's beginning to go into labor and beginning to bring forth a new child, right? So he's equating his return to the birthing of a child. So what happens in... Uh, when a woman goes into labor, she begins to get contractions. And as we get closer to birth, the con contractions become more regular, more often, and they become more severe or more strong, right? And so this first section, which is global, he's really saying, us, here's what's going to be in the news, right? Here's what the newspaper headlines are going to say. There's going to be deception out there. There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. So you're going to endure this. You're, there's going to be nation rising against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be famine and pestilence and upheaval in nature. So in this first section, he's saying there's going to be great deception. There's going to be wars, rumors of wars, uh, kingdom against kingdom. There's going to be famine, pestilence, similar to what we're living in today <coughs> with COVID-19, and then earthquakes upheaval in nature in various areas. So this first section 
is the beginning of birth pangs. Now the Bible, the way it lays it out here, it doesn't mean that this ends and then we start another section. It means that this will intensify all the way to the return of the Lord. So these, these, this, these news items, right? These things that we're going to wake up every day and see until he returns uh, are going to be there and they're going to be more intense and more frequent, right? But here's what he says in it. He says that these things must come to pass and he said that we're not to be troubled. And I'm going to go through the negative actions or negative responses as I get through the sections of scripture here. So we see the first section. Then verse 9 turns now to us, turns to the believers. It says, Then they will deliver you up to tribulation. They'll kill you. You will be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Okay, so it now turns from global to something that is now the church or the real church. It's, it, he's basically, because we're talking about uh, the the true church here. We're not talking about those that identify as Christians. We're talking about those that are actually Christians. When I say those that identify as Christians, there's a whole slew of believers on the face of the earth that, that truly know the word of God, have engaged with Jesus Christ and have a relationship with him, right? They're, they believe, they have faith in him, that he's active, alive. They believe in his word. They're walking toward him. They're growing. They're renewing their minds. They're they're living the life. And then you have a whole slew of people that were born into a Christian family and believe that they're Christian. They believe that they, because of their birth, it's a birthright. And so I don't want to get into that, but those that this time, those that at this time of, of, of that we're entering here in the end times, those that truly will walk the walk, those that will live the word of God, those that will display light without compromise, those that will be true to the word of God and faithful to Jesus Christ, the Bible says that they will deliver you up that are walking that walk to tribulation. They'll kill you. They'll, you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So essentially he's saying there's coming a time when there'll be a global, a global uh, movement against true ch Christianity, against professing Christ. I mean, we see it in our nation to a certain extent, but we've had many freedoms here. But there's a time coming and we're beginning to see the, the, the pieces of it now that when you proclaim Christ or proclaim the word of God or stand for what the word of God says, people come against you, right? And, and so as being not tolerant, not loving, and they don't understand we love them, uh, but this is what we believe and this is what we walk in. And so we don't want our kids taught that. We don't want it in our homes. Uh, but at the same time, if they're hungry, we'll feed them, right? But there, there's coming a time is a sign that there'll be true persecution for standing for what's truth in the word of God. It says in many, and when the Bible says many here, if you remember back, uh, it says, verse 5, it says, many will come in my name, saying I'm Christ, and will deceive many. Whenever it says many, it really means most. It means a, there's a large quantity, right? It says, so many will be offended Betray one another, hate one another. So many will be offended at, at the persecution, at what they have to walk for through, what they have to endure. And because of that pressure, they'll betray one another, hate one another, right? And come against one another. And what we see here is that they're, not, they're compromising walking in love. They're compromising walking with the word. So the pressure not only causes offense, but it also causes fear and that fear causes a, a lashing out or a change uh, or an anger toward one another. It says, and many false prophets will arise up and deceive many. So there'll be many false prophets in, in the time. And most false prophecy, um, really, uh, when you look back through scripture, most pro false prophecies about good things that are going to happen. I mean, there's a lot of good prophecies about the future. But by and large, most false prophecy in the Old Testament had to be a, painting a very rosy picture over what, what's going on and not the truth about what the Lord says. Uh, nobody sells a lot of books with, with, with negativity and, and, uh, and uh, uh, painful periods that may be coming. Verse 12 says, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. 
That word love is actually the word agape love, which we, we call unconditional love, but it's, a, it's an actionable love. It will go from hot to cold because of the social environment, right? And I'm going to go back through these. In this gospel, the kingdom will be preached unto all the world for witness to all nations, and then the end will come. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whosoever reads it, let him understand. Verse 16 then says, then let those in Judea. Verse 15 is a very specific event that happens about three and a half years before the Lord returns, where Antichrist is on the earth. He goes into the temple, um, and then it starts this third section. So this, I'm not going to get into that today. I want to talk about these other two sections, right? Because these two sections can last for decades. We know we're in them now. We know that the return of the Lord is imminent. Um, I've been teaching this for years. We don't know the date, and nobody should really peg a date. Uh, we're, we really need to look at the signs and understand that it lays ahead of us. And why, do, why am I so confident? I'm so confident because of the nation of Israel. I'm so confident because if you study Bible history, Israel was not a nation all the way from 70 AD to 1948, May 14, 1948. And then it didn't have Jerusalem, which was very important until 1967. When you take other prophecies and other things that line up, we can't go more than 100 years beyond uh, uh, 1967. I think it's much shorter. And the reason I say that is a, it says that this generation will not pass that sees, sees these things. It actually says it here. Um, and so 1967, I believe, starts the clock because they consolidated Jerusalem and the land that they currently have. They actually had complete control of the Temple Mount and because of the freedoms in Israel gave everyone access to the Dome of the Rock and the other areas within Jerusalem. And now we see the world coming against them, trying to break it up. But, but understand, the, start, the, the stop clock of God started uh, ticking in 1967. So whether I'm, I'm 61, whether I'm here or it's my children that'll be here, we're in that, we're in that generation. So these signs, wars, rumors of wars, uh, and the persecution against the church will continue now all the way until, until the return of the Lord. And so what I want you to see here is I want you to see the events. So he, he says that there's great deception, right? Holy Spirit says there's great deception. Um, it, uh, verse 4 and 5 says, Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no one deceives you, Many will come in my name. What does that mean, name mean? In the name of Christianity, many will come and say, I am the anointed, I'm the Christ, and what will deceive many. Verse 11 says, many false prophets will arise and deceive many. So one of the events is, de is deception. So uh, uh, that's one of the major events. Then there's wars, threats, and rumors of wars, right? Then there's famine which means food supply, food chain, dryness, lack of rain, lack of food. Famines are going to be more frequent. And then it says pestilence, which we're living in now. And we know that COVID-19 is one of five uh, viruses and plagues, really, that have encompassed the earth. This is the first one to bring us to a place of shutting down. But if you go back 10 years, every two years we've had something, H1N1, Ebola, uh, different flu viruses that have caused uh, outbreaks and death. This is the first one that really brought us to a place of, 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 of hibernation. And what it should do is it should be a wake-up call to understand just how fragile things are. We went from the best economy in the world ever, lowest unemployment ever, and two to three weeks later, we're in massive shutdown with massive unemployment moving into, rece into recession, possibly depression. And, you know, I think we're coming out of this, as I told you in previous messages. However, it should be a wake-up call to us that, you know, this will happen again and that there's a, there's a preparation that needs to, be, needs to be made. What we learn in this, I'll get into a little bit later, <coughs> but, and understand that these things should not, should not take us by surprise as we move forward. 
we need to we need to we need to actually run into them and use them as a positive understanding that that God is with us. So there's deception, there's wars, threats of wars, famine, pestilence, there's upheaval in nature, right? We er, whether it be earthquakes and 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 hurricanes and other things that we've seen. And there's persecution, tribulation on the church, and there's a last one, and that word is apostasy. It says many will be offended, many will believe false teachings and false prophets, many the love of many will wax cold. So that's apostasy. The response will be to leave the church. The response will be, I didn't sign up for this. So I want to go through the negative responses. I want to go through what are the actions. So don't be deceived. What's the action? God doesn't want us to be deceived. He wants us to understand truth. There'll be plenty of time for fear. He says, do not be troubled, right? Um, uh, don't, don't be in fear. You know, these things must come to pass. There's also offended. It says many will be offended. And I want to look at offense. What does it mean to be offended? And then it says that many will compromise. So they'll compromise the word. What does that mean? It means that they'll believe false teaching. They'll believe a false doctrine. They'll believe false prophecy. But also, verse 12 says, because lawlessness will abound, the love of many. He's talking about believers. The love of many will actually wax cold, right? That's compromise when you begin to, to not walk in love. And so that overall response of deception, fear, offense, and compromise are the negative actions. So Jesus told us the events. He said, these things are going to happen. And here's what I want, here's what's going to happen to some that believe in me and, and believe in my name. They're going to be offended. They're going to walk in fear. They're going to be deceived. They're going to walk in compromise and they're going to apostate. And so he's drawing a picture here and, and he's telling us it so that we can realize it. We can, we can look at it and understand it and try to, as we looked in 1 Thessalonians, our opening scripture, we can try to prepare ourselves to understand the feeling, the emotion, and understand the correct response, right? <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to go through these. So what's offense? Offense, and I looked it up today. Offense means being annoyed, resentful, angry, hurt, confused, and basically offended because of the situation you find yourself in. When, you, when I take that Webster's Dictionary understanding of what offense is, I take the biblical point of view because we did a word study on being offended. And the biblical word, word study basically tells us that being offended is having a lack of knowledge or understanding about the truth and reacting resentful toward it. And so um, even though, and we're going to look at two different situations, <coughs> but being offended really means that you have a lack of knowledge and truth and understanding about the situation you find yourself in. You become resentful. You become annoyed at it. You, 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 you then lash out in anger and hurt and, and you become confused. And so you basically walk away. So let's take a look at John. Go to John chapter 6 with me. And let's look at uh, a group that got offended. We'll look at two different areas. Here in John chapter 6, uh, Jesus is talking uh, about communion. He basically just tells them that you're going to eat my body and drink my blood, right? And so uh, when we, we catch it in verse 60, I don't want to go through the whole teaching, but in verse 60, it says, therefore, many of his disciples, see, these are disciplined people that are walking with them. When they heard this saying, this is a hard saying for who can understand this. So this is his disciples reaction at hearing you're going to eat my body and drink my blood. Right. So Jesus speaks. He knew in himself, verse 61, that his disciples complained about this. And he said to them, does this offend you? He says, what then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life, and the flesh profits nothing. 
He said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit, they are life. So he's telling them, I, when I taught you communion about, uh, about eating my body and drinking my blood, it wasn't physical, it was spiritual. It's something that, that is spiritual. It has nothing to do with the real flesh. So he's explaining it to them. He said, but there are some of you here that do not believe, for Jesus knew in the beginning who they were that did not believe and who would betray him. And he said, therefore, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him of my father. Verse 66, from that time forward, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. So after this teaching and not having an understanding, being offended, even Jesus trying to explain it to them, they had a lack of knowledge and a lack of understanding. They couldn't put it together. They were perplexed by it, even though he explained it. And the Bible says that they apostated. They stopped walking with him because they didn't understand and they had lack of knowledge of what he was, what he was doing and what was going on. It says, And Jesus said to the twelve, Does this also, Do you also want to go away? Do you also want to leave me? Do you want to apostate? But Peter answered him and said, Lord, where shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to know that you are the Christ and the Son of the living God. We're not teaching a complete message on offense here, but what stabilized the guys that stayed with him was, even though we don't get it, we're going to stay with you because we know you're the one, right? And so we see here that a lack of knowledge, a lack of understanding, a lack of the truth, and not taking the time to find it caused them to be resentful, annoyed, angry, and, and, and they, they apostated, they left. A good example of this is if you go over to Matthew 26, Matthew chapter 26, in verse 31, it says, And Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night, for it is written. The word stumble there is offended. All of you will be made to be offended because of me this night. He says, I will, he's quoting now from another scripture. He says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been risen, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Jesus said to him, surely I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said all of, all of his disciples. So Peter's the one that, that's quoted, but all of them said that. So here I want you to see this because this is sort of where we're at. Jesus is telling him that he's going to have to be arrested. He's going to die. And he tells them, you guys are going to be offended at me. You're going to be offended because of the pressure. You're going to, fear is going to come in. You're going to, in a way, apostate. You're going to leave me. You're going to run from me. You're going to deny me to people. You're going to deny knowing me. Peter, having a false expectation of the strength he had and who he was, said, even if I have to die, I'm not going to ever deny you. Well, we know the story, and we're going to read the story, actually, when we talk on fear. But here he knew it was coming. He knew what was coming. Jesus told him, similar to what we have in Matthew 24, that this pressure is coming. There's a pressure coming where you guys are going to be offended, right? <clears throat> Peter, knowing that, had false expectations of what he could do or what he could handle, right? And we know the story. He, be, he became offended. He, he, he ran. In fact, let's just, I guess, let's talk a little bit about fear since we're here. Go over to verse 67 of the ch same chapter. Let's look at how Peter reacted. I do want to come back to offense for one more scripture. But look at verse 67. So then they spat on, in his face. So they were spitting on Jesus, right? They beat him. Others struck him with the palm of their hand. They slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, Christ. Who is it that struck you, right? They had a bag over his head. It says, now Peter sat outside in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, saying, you also were with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied it before them all, saying, I do not know him who you're speaking of. Verse 71, Then after you had gone out of the gateway, another girl, 
saw him and said to those who were there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. But again, he denied with an oath, I do not know this man. Verse 73, A little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for your speech betrays you. And then he began to curse, he began to swear, saying, I do not know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed. Peter remembered the words that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crowed, you will deny me three times. So he went out, and he, what did he do? He wept bitterly. Now, let's, let's look at this, because Jesus said, You're going to be offended at me. You're going to resent walking with me. You're going to be annoyed. You're going to be angry. You're going to be hurt. You're, you're, you're going to be confused, right? So that's the offense piece of it. The fear piece of it now comes in when the actual tribulation and persecution, the, the having to stand his faith and stand a guarding against this fear, right? <clears throat> so now he's in the center of the storm, right? It's like us being in the center of Matthew 24. So there's a couple of things we learn here. Number one, we all have a false expectation of just how much faith and strength we have. The second is, we're, when we're tested, when we're put in the vice, the pressure cooker, in the situation, the real us, the real level of faith, love, establishment, firmness, strength and love, faithfulness, really comes out. Will we stand in the midst of the storm or will we fall, right? Only pressure can test that, because we can say all day long, I'll die for you, Lord. Peter did, uh, and I'm sure he thought he would, right? So, so not only is, do we have false expectations, and pressure tests us and brings up to the surface the weakness in us, but the third thing is God already knows us better than we know us, right? And so that's why we need to submit to him, and that's why we need to have a, a strong understanding of him and the stronger understanding we have of God's love and understanding of us and be able to not associate what's going on with us uh, in our physical environment. Because when we look in Romans, it says, what can separate us from the love of God? Can persecution, tribulation separate us? He's trying to teach us that don't equate the circumstances you're in necessarily to my love for you. So, so God knows us and knows what we're made of. He also knows what we're walking into, so he's preparing us. He's using these time periods of pressure in our life where we have to stand, right, and rely on him to establish and strengthen us. We learned this in 1 Peter chapter 5 the other day. We learned that after we've suffered a while, right, after we cast our cares on the Lord, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, will try to bring fear in, Resist him steadfastly in the faith. The Bible says that after we've suffered a while, will establish us, strengthen us, settle us, perfect us. It means that not the persecution and the tribulation or the trial or the pressure itself, but our reliance on God, his word, and our faithfulness in, in having faith in him to see us through that storm creates within us a root system that establishes us. It perfects us. Peter got perfected, he, right? In, in Acts chapter 12, he's in prison with a death sentence. The next day, they're going to take his head off. We find him falling into a deep sleep. He, got, he grew into a, a, a position where he wasn't offended and he wasn't fearful. And it's because of the things he endured and the things that he's seen, the things that he experienced, right? And, and so when it comes to fear, even if you look in 2 Timothy chapter 1, when Timothy was fearful because of about the same thing, there was a great apostasy in the church. 1 Timothy was written to a church that was expanding and growing. So he said, appoint these kinds of men in different positions as bishops and deacons under you <coughs> to help you with the affairs, delegate. So in 2 Timothy, the church is apostating because there's great persecution. People are being killed, put in prison, separated from families. So Paul writes him a letter, and he tells him. Here's what he tells him. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Now that tells me 
that there's a spirit of fear, which means a spirit has a voice. A spirit is an entity. It has, it, it, it's a being, right? And so there are spirits of fear whose function is to bring us fear. So we have to deal with them. And you deal with them by, by guarding with the word of God, taking a position against them verbally by speaking against them, rebuking them, and you taking control of what, you, what, what real estate in your mind you give them. <clears throat> but what he says to, to Timothy is interesting. He said, take authority over it. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So an unsound mind walks in fear. When you're in fear, you're making, look at what Peter did. He started swearing. He started, he didn't just deny Jesus. He started cursing and swearing and making a tantrum that I didn't know him, right? I mean, what brought that out of him? It was fear. It brought to the surface his weakness. But in 2 Timothy, Paul tells him, and here's what fear does. It steals time from your life. It steals minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, years, because it, you're, you're, you're trapped in your fear. So here's what Paul tells him. Paul tell, We probably should have turned there. <laughs> Paul tells him, remember, go back in your memory and remember when, when I laid hands on you. Remember the experiences you had with the Holy Spirit. Remember the testimonies of how the Spirit of God worked in your life and the power was released. Remember the times that God's seen you through a circumstance. And so what does that tell me? If we line up 1 Thessalonians 5 that we open with, we looked at Matthew 24, right? And we looked at the offenses. That tells me that you have to have something inside of you to draw on when the fear comes. <clears throat> you have to have a reference point in you. You have to have a testimony from God you have to be able to remember the times that God answered your prayer, the times that the word brought light. And he, because that remembrance, that bringing it up, causes us to remember how faithful God is because fear causes us to just look at the circumstances. And we learned this uh, last Tuesday when Peter was walking on the water, when he looked at the wind and the waves and the circumstances, Faith left, fear took over. It wasn't God judging him. It was his faith left and fear took over inside of him. And so he, the thing that he feared came upon him. We're going to talk about this Tuesday. And when fear came upon him, faith left. He left the supernatural and began to walk or live according to what happened to everyone else that left the boat. They sank. And, and so we see a very distinct example there. It's the same thing here. Peter, when, 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 when fear came on Timothy and Peter, they began to lash out, be offended, be resentful. They began to act, you know, ungodly in a way. Uh, Peter was ungodly. He was swearing. I mean, he was, he was not just, he was cursing. He was swearing. He was denying. And so fear brings that to the surface. And so the end times, the Bible says that many will be offended because of the circumstance they find him in, which is very similar to Peter. In other words, you know, the, 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 the offense will be denying the truth, which will cause a rift within Christianity. The fear will also cause people to apostate. It'll cause them to look for false prophecy that gives them uh, a, a, a unrealistic look at what's ahead instead of settling back and saying, okay, God, what's, what do I have to do tomorrow? Well, how do I get through this? How do I be productive in it, right? And, and so offense and fear really can take from us the, the very life that's inside of us. And, and the answer, saints, is number one, we need to teach it. We need to teach this. Uh, Paul, I mean, at the opening, uh, Paul writing at Holy Spirit telling us, I shouldn't have to tell you these things. You should know them and be established them already. That sudden destruction and crisis comes and, you know, don't be offended by it. Don't fear it. Walk in it and understand I'm with you because I'm with you in the water and I'm with you in the fire, right? When it comes to compromise, <coughs> go over to uh, 2 Timothy 
2 Timothy. Second Timothy, we're going to look at three scriptures here. Um, and I want you to understand, 2 Timothy is written to the church. It's written to Timothy for the church. First, chapter 3, verse 1, it says, But know this in the last days. In the last of the last days. In other words, this is what it's going to be like, Timothy, in the last of the last days. Perilous times will come. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitor, heady, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, looking like it, but denying the power, which is the Holy Spirit, and from such turn away. So he's describing in the last days that that the church will look much like the world. I mean, this is what the world looks like. And it says that, that in the last days, perilous times will come because men will, and it really, you know, how do we know how tall we are in Christianity? When we, we know how tall we are by the amount of love we walk in, right? So it's not, it's not how much scripture you can quote, and, and, and uh, even the Bible tells us even in Corinthians that if, even if you're a martyr, you give all your money away. It's, it's how much love do you walk in, right? So how much of Christ is in you, basically? So he's saying that men will be lovers of themselves. Well, love doesn't care about, it's selfless. It cares about the other person. So as you go through this list, <coughs> this is what he says in the last days. There'll be all kinds of compromise, okay? So there's two scriptures, one before and one after. If you look at chapter 4, Actually, look at the end of chapter 3, verse 16. It says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Literally, all scripture is God-breathed, right? And is profitable for doctrine. Do you want to know what sound doctrine is? It's the word of God. For reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So all scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is given by the God who created all things. The God is, who is eternal. The God who put breath in our life, who put the sun in its place, who spoke the world into existence. And that doctrine that he gave us in scripture is profitable for us to understand God, understand truth, reproof and correction, to correct us and reprove us, and also to instruct us in the life of right righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped into every good work. In other words, the word of God in scripture brings us to this perfection, establishing, settling, and, and uh, causing us to be strengthened in the things of God. It says, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. So there's no chapter and verse in the original letter. Man put that in. So he went from, Here's what's happening in the, in the last days, that men will, will, the love of many will wax cold, many will be deceived, many will be walking according to the world and having a form of godliness, looking the part, but underneath they're, they're, they're not, right? And he says, Scripture is what gets us stable and steady. He says, but I charge you, therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge, so now we're talking about judgment, the living and the dead <coughs> at his what? Return and his kingdom. So he opens this section of his letter saying, here's what scripture will do. Jesus is going to judge this. Okay. He goes on to say, verse two, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season. In other words, be ready all the time. Very similar to first Thessalonians chapter five, where we opened. It says, be ready in season, out of season, convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth or sound doctrine and be turned aside to fables. So what's he saying here? 
He's saying that in the last days, here's a picture of, 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 of great or many in the church. And here, it's not even talking about leadership. He says they, meaning those that sit in the seats, the congregations, right? They'll not endure with sound doctrine, not going to put up with it. What are they going to do? They're going to compromise it. <clears throat> They're going to compromise it to satisfy their own itch in their ears. They're going to want to hear what they want to hear. They're going to heap to themselves teachers, which means heap means create large environments, large churches, large bodies of, of people that identify as Christians. They're going to what? For their own desires, man-made desires, pleasing man, they're going to come out with a gospel that will not be sound in doctrine, but will, will satisfy man's pleasures, give man comfort and confidence in his current lifestyle, not make demands on them or unsettle them with truth. And they're going to turn their ears away from the truth and they're going to turn aside unto what? Fables or man-made fables and what? But you be watchful, endure affliction, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministries. And so we see here, <coughs> we see that this, uh, this compromise, it really, when you, take, when you take the compromise of not telling truth and not teaching truth and not bringing people to a place of understanding, we're going to have to endure this, we're going to have to go through this, right? And not understanding that uh, a false expectation of God, a false understanding of God, puts you in a position to be offended, to, to be in fear, to be confused, to be perplexed, right? And to begin to compromise and, and to apostate. <clears throat> and so uh, the Bible tells us that this is a condition, but here is church doctrine which enhances that. In chapter 2, in verse 30, verse 24, it says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, so the true servant of God must not be quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach with patience, in humility, humbly, correcting those in the opposition. If God perhaps will give them repentance so they may know the truth and they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having taken them captive to do his will. Then he goes on to say, but know this in the last days perilous times will come. So the remedy is, is not to argue. The remedy is to teach truth and to be gentle to those in the opposition if possibly they repent and find the truth and get out of the snare of the devil. You know, I, we, can, we can teach, you know, five weeks on that. So, so understand that compromise will not allow you to stand in the midst of what's coming. It will not allow you to stand under pressure. And so we, we took up offense, we took up fear, we took up compromise. We're, we're, uh, we're ending the near of our message. I'll go through and I'll, what we're going to teach over the next weeks on, uh, on the rest of this, but understanding um, uh, deception, trying to understand deception. We're going to talk about some of that on Tuesday. But I want to close. Go over to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19. I said a statement to you earlier, and it's actually our message on Tuesday, that while God is in charge of everything, God's not in control of everything. Um, in other words, he gave us a free will, a measure of free will. And, and so, uh, but at the same time, God knows everything. <laughs> he knows our future. He knows our hearts. And, and so when we look at it, I, I want it to open to a time when, uh, when a group of people uh, live through something, uh, and because it was offered to them, they of their free will rejected it. And as a result of their uh, rejection, they had to endure something that was unnecessary. <clears throat> so if you're in Luke 19, turn to verse 41. Now as he drew near, he saw the city. This is Jesus seeing the city of Jerusalem. The Bible says Jesus wept over it. So he sees Jerusalem from a distance. 
he begins weeping over the city. And here's what, he, here's what he said. If you had known, even you, especially in this day, the things which make for your peace, the things that you could have had, the peace you could have had, but now they are hidden from your eyes. In other words, the, what, what happened is, didn't have to happen if, you, if your ears were open, if you, were, if you had studied up, if you had given yourself to the word of God, if you had surrendered to me, he said, this is why Jesus is weeping. It's called lost opportunity. He said, if you guys would have known what really belonged to you, what you could have possessed, what you could have walked in, the peace you could have had, but now it's hidden for, from you. For the day will come upon you when your enemies will build an embarkment around you, surround you, close you in on every side, and level you and your children within you to the ground, and they will not leave here one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. Then he went out of the temple, began to drive those out who bought and sold in it, saying, It isn't written, my house is a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of thieves. And he began to teach them daily. You know, I, I look at this, and you look at, I want you to try to uh, understand this, that Jesus came on the earth, even though there were a, there's a huge amount of prophecy speaking of him coming to the earth, the people that owned the Bibles, the people that were teachers, the people that were diligent in their religion at that time rejected him and didn't believe him, didn't give their hearts to him, even though the one they were waiting for, the Passover lamb, right, was walking among them. And so they missed this opportunity. But I have to tell you, if we lined them all up, they would have thought they were doing God's work and they were right. The deceived always thinks they're right, right? The deception of thinking you're right and thinking God is with you. Paul, Paul went through this. We're going to look at it Tuesday night. Paul went through this. He had a zeal that was founded on false doctrine. It was, it was founded upon, and even he had the same Bible we have to the to, to the all the way through uh, to Malachi. <clears throat> and so even with the word, he had deception and, 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 and was living a life killing Christians thinking he was doing God's work. And so how do you get that deceived? But you have the wrong information to stand on. In our case, I think that we have, uh, because of, 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 the, the environment we're in, we, we, we really uh, push the love and grace of God, which is absolutely true. I mean, the love and grace of God are great, but we've pushed it to a point where we've not trained ourselves to understand that the love and the grace of God is what gets us through this persecution that's coming. And so we have to, we have to teach on this. We have to begin to buckle down and teach on this. Before closing, I only have a minute left. We'll be back Tuesday night at 7. Guys, we have, uh, I have three curriculums. Understanding Jesus, which is about Jesus. Uh, don't get this wrong, which is uh, about end times. It's 12 hours on that teaching. And Are You Sure, which is on salvation. All of them have, uh, ten, all of them have 10 hours of teaching and a workbook. And they're essentially free. If you go to the Watchers of Truth website, you can download uh, chapters uh, in the book and you can download the teachings or you can email us and we'll send you a box copy. If you're a church, we'll send you a box copy and as many books as you want or a small group. They're free of charge. Also, you can go to our website and write to us at contact at watchersoftruth.com and send in your prayer request so we can stand with you. If, uh, whether you're in fear or walking through something, we can join together. We have others that will join together in prayer uh, with us. You could also support us and give to our ministry uh, and give to your church. And I've been saying it the last four or five times. One of the things that we're seeing drying up is the giving, right? And uh, because the uncertainty ahead, because of what's ahead. I don't know if I'm going to have my job. I don't know. These are a lot of things that go through uh, our minds. The Bible doesn't tell us. Uh, the Bible tells us 
to give of our first fruits, which means it, it, as long as there's fruit, there's giving. Uh, there, so if the fruit is cut off <coughs> because of unemployment or whatever else, then, you know, that's one thing. But if you're still fruitful, your church still has pastors and, and, and leaders that need to be paid and buildings that need to be paid. And, and it's our responsibility to give into that effort. If you've been fed from us, we ask you to please donate to us and give to us. And then the last thing is um, the Bible says all things work together for good to those that love God and are called according to his purpose. While we have this social distancing, uh, this lack of meeting together, it doesn't mean that we should be separate in our actions toward one another. Uh, my wife and kids and our family, our extended family, has uh, started a, a movie club where they watch a movie at night and we interact, they interact. I'm not, I, so I occasionally step in and give my two cents, but, um, but uh, they interact about the movie and it gives them something to do. We, you could do that with friends and family, your old cell group or home fellowship group. You know, you could do curriculum still. You could still meet uh, through technology, right, through FaceTime or whatever else and continue to have that fellowship. You know, in the first century, when the pressure was on the church, they, you know, they, what did they do? They did fellowship. They did feasting together. They did learning the word of God. And they did uh, prayer together. And so we could still do three of those, right? The assembly piece of it is, is not there. But we could still fellowship uh, from a distance. We can still learn the word of God from a distance. And we can still pray with one another from a distance. So with that, let me, let's me let bow our heads in prayer. I ask you to, to engage, to keep going, to engage, to learn about you, to cause this to be a wake-up call. I believe we're going to come out of this. Um, and but use it as a positive. Use it as something working for you instead of against you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we thank you for this word this day. Lord, we thank you that your spirit would continue to develop continue to enlarge, expand, give further revelation and understanding concerning this word, this message today, Lord. We pray that this word, Father, that your spirit that lives in us, Father, would reveal to us things that we need to work on in our own lives, each of us individually. Father, we pray in Jesus' name, Lord God. I pray for our audience and those listening. Father, I pray that no plague would come nigh our dwelling. I pray, Father, that, Father, as... Uh, Father, the shadow of Peter caused healing as the aprons and clothing on Paul's body and on Jesus' body brought healing, Father, that we're vessels of healing, vessels of health, and that, Father, <coughs> just our very presence will bring health and healing. Lord, we give you glory and praise and honor. We love you so much. We love you, Jesus, for your word. We thank you for your spirit that lives in us, and we thank you for all of your promises. God bless you, and I'll see you on Tuesday evening, 7 o'clock.